Welcome everyone. My name is Terry Ross and I'm the director of the Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. On behalf of the Haskin School of Business, I warmly welcome you all to Corporate Innovation Day as a part of Innovation Week and Global Entrepreneurship Week. Thank you for joining us for conversations and insights about corporate innovation within our organizations. The Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation believes that our community has unrealized potential for entrepreneurial and innovative thinking skills. And today is a focused effort to work on that. The bottom line is, is that it's really quite hard to execute the business model of today, let alone the business model of tomorrow, but that is the reality of our current situation. So let's choose to look forward to innovating from within as a way of generating new wealth for us all. The Hunter Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation is pleased to partner on today's event with the Global Future Business Initiative, Platform Calgary, Executive Education, and Etch. Welcome to you all. The University of Calgary gratefully acknowledges that this event is not only being held in cyberspace, but also on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tutsina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Now today, BJ Gavarindajan will introduce everyone to the three box solution, a simple, accessible and powerful framework for exploring innovation led growth opportunities. The keynote will introduce you to core concepts and as well give you a sneak peek about the masterclass that we'll be delivering in early February. This is a tremendous opportunity to put the three box solution into practice and further information about this masterclass in February will be in the follow up messages that you will get from this event. To introduce VG, I would like to uh, introduce you to Anup Srivastava, who is Haskin's first Canada Research Chair and also a longtime collaborator with VJ. And I just learned also the second most published author in Harvard Business Review. Over to you, Anup. Thank you, Terry. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to introduce uh, Professor Vijay Govindarajan, VG as we affectionately call him. Now, I know that you're all waiting to listen to VG's talk and I'm the stumbling block between uh, you and VG, but let me take two minutes to introduce the importance of this talk. Now you're all here to formulate a strategy for innovative change. And let me tell you one thing, there is no better expert on this planet than VG at the intersection of strategy and innovation. In fact, as VG starts speaking, I just see that he, he came on screen. On the top right corner of his office, you can see two awards. VG has been inducted into Hall of Fame by Thinkers 50 in two different categories. Guess which ones? Innovation and strategy. Now to be inducted into even one hall of fame is like winning Nobel prize. VG has won that Nobel prize twice, innovation and strategy. In fact, VG is not only a conceptual person, he's also a practical person. One third of fortune 500 CEOs consult with VG and they're not looking just for theory, they're looking for practical solutions. Two important things about VG, VG is also the numbers man. You may not know this, but VG started his life as an accounting professor. He was actually the CPA gold medal winner from India. 1.3 billion people to be a CPA gold medal winner is not easy. Actually, VG won gold medal in six out of seven categories. Uh, he didn't win the seventh one because that was for the highest score by a lady, which VG didn't qualify. But the most important thing about VG, VG is an inspiration. VG has this unique knack of bringing the best out of people. And I am the prime example in front of you. When I met VG about five years ago, I was just a junior assistant professor at Tuck School of Business, uh, my colleague. Uh, VG was my colleague. And I wouldn't even dare to sub submit something to Harvard Business Review, forget about publishing it. And today I have 25 Harvard Business Review articles. California management review articles on very, very important topics, thanks to VG's inspiration. About half a million people constantly follow VG. Every word, every sentence he says or write, because VG is an inspiration. So without further ado, I 
uh, welcome VG on to this important platform. VG. Anup, uh, thank you very much. You know, look at the province of Alberta. It needs to be transformed. We need to transform the energy sector in Alberta. We need to create exciting new opportunities in the technology sector. We need to reimagine re opportunities in the tourism sector. When we talk about reimagination, transformation, innovation, I really got what it means to really innovate from my grandfather. My grandfather is just about everything for me and he taught me so much, but he also taught me what is strategy. And he told me strategy is innovation, something that the province of Alberta and all the corporations in Alberta must be, really must excel at. This is how it happened. You see, when I was in school, I used to stand first in class. That wasn't that difficult because there were only five kids in my class. And I knew the other four. I know how to beat them. Then I came to the university and my university had 25,000 students and I didn't know any of them. And I stood first in the university, won the gold medal. So I took my gold medal and my transcript to my grandfather. And my grandfather kind of looked at the transcript and he said, hmm, you only got 95 out of 100 in history. There is possible five marks you missed. We need to cross that possibility gap. You only scored 90 out of 100 in English. There is another art of the possible in English that we need to cross. He wasn't trying to intimidate me. He wasn't trying to humiliate me. He wasn't trying to embarrass me. What he was telling me was, VG, never be satisfied in being a gold medalist amongst 25,000 students. That should never be your bar. Your bar should be your true potential. What my grandfather told me was, strategy is about achieving your true potential. Everyone listening on this Zoom call, you have to ask yourself, are you achieving your true potential? If you are not, then you are not realizing the power of strategy. Every organization in the province of Alberta has to ask themselves a question. Are we achieving our true potential? If you are not, then you haven't understood the secret sauce behind strategy. What my grandfather was telling me was, your accomplishments are limited by your expectations. Don't limit your achievement by your expectations. What my grandfather told me was make current competition irrelevant. The 25,000 students with whom you are competing in that university, that is, they are irrelevant. If you're Colgate Palmolive, don't look at Procter & Gamble. That leads to mediocrity. The only competition that matters is self-competition. And self-competition is about achieving true potential. My grandfather wasn't putting pressure on me to perform. He was daring me to dream. There is a fundamental difference. As parents, either we can put pressure on our kids to perform or dare them to dream. My grandfather was telling me, look, you got a dream to achieve your true potential. That is what strategy is all about. Therefore, I want to ask every organization listening in on this Zoom call, are you achieving your true potential? Another way I can ask the same question is, think about all the projects you execute inside your organization today and put them in three boxes. How many of the projects you're executing today will be in box one? And box one is about manage the present. It is about improve the performance of your current businesses the way they are constructed today. This is all about optimizing your current system the way it exists. How many of your projects today are in box two? And box two is about selectively forget the past. And how many of your projects are in box three? And box three is about 
create the future. Manage the present, box one. Selectively abandon the past, box two. And create the future, box three. And what I find working with organizations is organizations way over focus on box one. And then they think they are doing strategy. Is box one important? Absolutely. But strategy must also include box two and box three. What is the challenge for organizations in box three? How are you going to create your future in the year 2030? How are you going to achieve your true potential by the year 2030? And if you want to achieve your true potential by the year 2030, then you have a job to do in box two. Namely, you have to selectively forget. Let me clarify one thing right away. Strategy for any organization, and certainly includes all the organizations that are listening in on the Zoom call, is about becoming a leader in the year 2030. That's what strategy is all about. But strategy is not about what you have to do in the year 2030. Strategy is very much about the projects you're executing today in the year 2020 across the three boxes so that you intersect with the year 2030. How are you allocating resources today? How is the organization energy focused today across the three boxes so that you stay relevant in the next decade? Another word for box one is competition for the present. That is all about efficiency. Another word for box two, box three is competition for the future. That is all about innovation. Of course, competition for the present is important, just as important as competition for the future is. Therefore, strategy is always about how do you create the future while managing the present? How do you shape the evolution of year 2030 when you're squarely executing projects in the year 2020? And the reason why this is a challenge is the people, the processes, the capabilities it takes to excel in box one are fundamentally different than the people, the processes, the capabilities it takes to excel in box two, box three. Yet in the year 2020, you have to excel in box one. But in the year 2020, you have to excel in box two, box three, if you want to achieve your true potential by the year 2030. Yet these two types of projects require different people, different processes, different capabilities. This is the central strategic challenge. Let me give you a very simple example to highlight why this is such a big challenge. Imagine the year is 1903. Imagine you are in Boston and you have to go to London. There is only one way you can make that trip in the year 1903. That would be by a ship. And a ship those days took 45 days to make the trip. Suppose you want to go, wanted to go faster than 45 days. What could you have done? One thing we could have done is call a meeting of the Shipbuilders Association, study the ship, increase the engine speed, study the weather conditions on the ocean. This is what I call box one thinking. This is all about optimizing the efficiency of a system that you fully understand. By the way, 100 years of doing that, even today, perhaps the fastest ship may take five days to do a cross-Atlantic trip. In the year 1903, Wright brothers asked a fundamentally different question because they were focused on competition for the future. They asked the question, is it possible to avoid ground altogether when we travel? Today, a plane might take five hours to do a cross-Atlantic trip, whereas even the fastest ship will take five days. Not that improving the efficiency of the ship is unimportant. You got to do that. But simultaneously, you have to invent the plane if you want to achieve true potential in the future. This is the central challenge for Alberta, the province of Alberta. You got lots of ships today. You got to continue to improve the efficiency of those ships. But you must invent the plane today so that you can be a leader 
in the year 2030. Yet you will agree with me, the people, the processes, the capabilities it takes to improve the efficiency of the ship, they are fundamentally different than the people, the processes, the capabilities it takes to invent the plane. This is the central leadership challenge. By the way, everything that I'm going to describe to you in these 55 minutes is simple to say, but not simple to do. My simple message is future is now. Future is not about what you have to do in the future. And the reason why this is so hard is today I have two jobs to do. One job is in box one. Another job is in box two, box three, unlocking the future. Yet there are inherent conflicts, inherent paradoxes, inherent tensions between the two. This is the central strategic challenge for all organizations. Let me take a minute and give you a sense for what it takes to do box one projects and what kind of thinking is needed for box two, box three projects. Competition for the present projects, box one projects are always in response to what I call clear signals and linear changes in your industry. Because you're responding to clear signals and linear changes in your industry, the organizational response would be incremental improvements in your current business model. Call it Six Sigma quality, call it continuous process improvement, call it operational excellence. These are all powerful ideas, but they are box one ideas. Competition for the future projects, box two, box three projects, are always in response to what I call weak signals and non-linear changes in your industry. Because you're responding to non-linear changes in your industry, the organizational response would be breakthrough innovation. Now, what is an example of a non-linear change in the industry using which someone was able to launch a breakthrough innovation? If you want to take a look at the last decade, I would say the internet itself was a non-linear change. Why? Because non-linear changes in the external environment is what you can use to generate a box tree breakthrough idea inside your organization. Concepts like Airbnb, Uber would not be possible without a discontinuous ship called the internet. For all the organizations in the province of Alberta, look at the next decade and ask yourself the following question. What are the nonlinear changes in my industry using which I can start a box two, box three breakthrough innovation today? Certainly, technologies are going to disrupt every industry, including yours, for sure. But technology is not the only source of nonlinear changes. There could be huge customer discontinuities. Customers of the future could be fundamentally different than the customers of the present. If the future customers are different than today's customers, the future customers will demand box three breakthrough innovation. There could be non-traditional competitors who can come into your space and force you to remake yourself. Let me give you an example of a customer discontinuity, which is creating all kinds of exciting opportunities for all organizations. I'm pretty sure, including organizations in the province of Alberta. I'm talking about emerging markets like India. Say if you're an American company, you can't take business models you created in box one for the American consumer and simply send those business models to India and hope to capture the market space in India. Why? because emerging markets represents a huge customer discontinuity. Customers in emerging markets are fundamentally different than customers in developed markets. If the emerging market customers are fundamentally different, they will demand box three breakthrough innovation. Let me give you an example of a company which did box three breakthrough innovation in emerging markets. The example I'm going to use is General Electric, 
this is GE's healthcare business. As you know, GE Healthcare, they make medical imaging equipments. This would be an X-ray machine, a CAT scanner, an MR machine, an ultrasound. And what you are seeing here is an electrocardiogram or an ECG machine. As you know, ECG is the first point of diagnosis for heart attack. And GE innovated this machine for the American consumer. This is an extraordinarily powerful piece of equipment. This has saved lives. This has saved millions of American lives. This ECG machine probably costs about $20,000. Imagine an American hospital. Suppose you walk into an American hospital, what do you see? You see a sophisticated imaging center. And in that sophisticated imaging center, you will have appliance size equipment a $1 million X-ray machine, a $2 million CAT scanner, a $3 million MR machine, and this $20,000 ECG machine. And when the doctor asks the patient to go to the imaging center, the patient goes there. This is the way an American hospital is structured. I want you to shift the scene for a moment to India. Certainly, G sells this $20,000 ECG machine in India, for sure to the top 10% of the economic pyramid. After all, even in a poor country like India, there are going to be some rich folks, but it is a thin slice. The question is, what about the remaining 90% of Indians? The remaining 90% of Indians cannot use this $20,000 ECG mission for a variety of reasons. The first and the most obvious reason is affordability. You see, on this $20,000 ECG machine, a single ECG scan will cost $200. 90% of Indians, most of them live in rural India. And in rural India, people are making $2 a day, sometimes even less. Now you can do the mental math. If I'm making $2 a day and somebody sells me, an ECG scan for $200. That means I have to work for 100 days just to pay for one scan. That is only to determine whether I need further tests. I'm going to say, forget it. I can live with my chest pain. But affordability is not the only reason why 90% of Indians are non-consumers of this $20,000 ECG machine. They have additional problems. What are the additional problems? You see, in rural India, there are no hospitals with sophisticated imaging centers. That means in rural India, you can't ask a patient to go to the imaging center because the imaging center doesn't exist. That means somebody has got to take this $20,000 ECG machine door to door. Unfortunately, this $20,000 ECG machine weighs 500 pounds. If something weighs 500 pounds, I can't put it in my backpack and take it door to door. Not only that, this $20,000 ECG machine can work only out of house current. As you well know, in rural India, electricity is either unavailable or unreliable. So even if you manage to take this machine to a village in India, Maybe the villager doesn't have electricity to operate this piece of equipment. Finally, this $20,000 ECG machine is extraordinarily powerful piece of equipment. It requires a trained doctor to operate this machine. It usually comes with a 500 page user's manual. Well, in rural India, there are no trained doctors. That means for a variety of reasons, 90% of Indians cannot use this $20,000 ECG machine. That doesn't mean 90% of Indians don't suffer from heart attack. This is my main point. Non-consumers of healthcare in this world have exactly the same problem as consumers of healthcare. The reason why they are non-consumers is they cannot consume the business model you are giving to the consumers. If they could consume it, they would have already become consumers. If you can do box tree innovation, if you can do breakthrough innovation, 
you can convert these non-consumers into consumers. I want you to consider these facts. Today, in the world, there are 7 billion people. Out of 7 billion people, I want to ask every organization in the province of Alberta, out of the 7 billion, how many can be consumers of your business model? Think about the large non-consumers who you could convert if you did box three breakthrough innovation. In 2008, I took a two year leave of absence from Dartmouth College and went to work full time for General Electric. And this is the very first project I got involved in. I got involved in innovating a $100 ECG machine. Now on this $100 ECG machine, a single ECG scan will cost 10 cents. If a single scan costs 10 cents, even if I'm making only $2 a day, if I got a severe chest pain, I am willing to allocate 10 cents for a scan. Besides being affordable, this $100 ECG machine is extraordinarily lightweight. It weighs less than a can of Coca-Cola. If something weighs less than a can of Coca-Cola, I can put it in my backpack and take it door to door. Not only that, this $100 ECG machine works out a battery. On a single battery charge, it can produce 750 scans. Finally, this $100 ECG machine is extremely simple to operate. Perhaps you can't quite see it on this slide. It has got only two buttons. There is a green button, and then there is a red button. You push the green button, it works. You push the red button, it stops. As long as you know how to read traffic signs, you should be able to operate this machine. GE has converted a whole lot of non-consumers into consumers with this $100 ECG machine. Box three is about creating the market. Box one is a market share game. In the province of Alberta, we got to play both. We have to play the market share game, but also we need to create new markets. By the way, everything that I'm describing to you so far is so simple to understand. If it is so simple to understand, why is this so hard to do? One way I can explain why this is so hard is by taking a metaphor from sports. What I have here is the gold medal winners in high jump in Olympics. Olympics, I suppose, started in 1896. So we have got about 100 plus years of data here. When you plot the 100 years of data of gold medal winners in high jump in Olympics, what you immediately see is there have been four, box two, box three, breakthrough innovations in the style in high jump. And only when there was a breakthrough innovation in the style in high jump could the high jumper realize his true potential. Remember, my grandfather told me achieving true potential should be the goal of strategy. By the way, the first style in high jump was scissors. I got a picture of the scissors here. Even today, if someone asks you to do high jump, I bet you, you will use scissors. Think about it. Suppose you're walking on the road and you find a little rod. What do you do? You kind of jump over it, just like the way a hurdler would jump. It's a hurdling motion. Inside your organizations today, you got lots and lots of scissors. When scissors is the style in the high jump industry, and if you're a high jumper, you have a job to do. What is the job? Accept the rules of scissors and become the number one person in the scissors in the world. This is what I call box one thinking. This is about continuously improving the efficiency of your scissors. Is that important to do? Absolutely critical. But what I'm saying is in the year 2020, 100% of the resources you allocate cannot be to improve the efficiency of scissors. You also need to allocate some resources to start a box two, box three, breakthrough innovation experiment that will transform the scissors. By the way, if there was absolutely no breakthrough innovation in the style in high jump, high jumpers cannot achieve the true potential that they're able to achieve today. 
1896, the first high jumper, when he invented scissors, he did four feet, two inches. Suppose in the last 100 years, all that we have done is to continuously improve the efficiency of scissors. That's all we did. And we didn't do any breakthrough innovation. High jumpers cannot achieve the performance they're achieving today. In the recently concluded 2016 Rio Olympics, the high jumper almost cleared eight feet. You cannot clear eight feet if you use the scissors business model, no matter how much you improve its efficiency. Why? Because scissors is a hurdling motion. If you use a hurdling motion, the center of gravity will define how high you can lift your body. There is only so much Six Sigma you can do. If you want to beat the center of gravity, you must change the business model. In fact, there have been four breakthrough innovations. I'm going to talk about the last one, Fosbury Flop. To no one's surprise, Fosbury Flop was innovated by Dick Fosbury. As the picture shows, what happens in the flop is you run up to the pole, you launch straight up, then you twist your body, just like the way a gymnast might twist his body. By the way, that was a box two, box three, breakthrough innovation. By twisting his body, Dick Fosbury was able to break out of the center of gravity and elevate quite a bit high. Again, imagine what happens in the flop. You're running up to the pole, you're launching straight up, then you are twisting your body. That means you are still straight up. Therefore, the very first thing that crosses the bar is your head. If you stop to think about it, Fosbury flop is the most illogical way to do high jump. Why? For one thing, you're not even looking at the bar. You're looking away from the bar. For another, head clears the bar first. For 100 years, we have been told in the high jump industry, leg must clear the bar first. Why? Because leg has to land first. Whereas in the flop, head clears the bar first. Then it is your neck. Then it is your back. In fact, the leg clears the bar the last. You literally land on your head, so to speak. This is the central challenge for the province of Alberta. If you want to transform the province of Alberta, in the year 2020, you must allocate resources to make your current scissors become even stronger. But in the year 2020, you must also allocate resources to innovate the flop. Another way I can say the same thing is, take a look at your strategic plan and ask yourself how many projects I have in my strategic plan, which will be in box one. Box one is about closing performance gap. Very, very important for you to close performance gap in your scissors. How you do it? You can call it operational excellence, Six Sigma, continuous process improvement, very powerful ideas, but important ideas. But in the year 2020, ask yourself the question, how many projects I have in my strategic plan, which will be in box two, box three. Box two, box three is about the art of the possible. It is about closing possibility gap. By the way, you cannot close your possibility gap by using the same principles that you use to close the performance gap. You have to do breakthrough innovation. This is what I'm trying to tell you. If your organizations have to realize true potential by year 2030, it's not about what you do in the year 2030. It's about what are you doing in the year 2020 in terms of closing performance gap plus closing possibility gap. That is how you become a leader in the year 2030. Yet, when I go into organizations, what I find is they way over focus on performance gap. Not that performance gap is unimportant. It's a question of balance. In fact, whenever I'm with organizations, I typically ask the CEO, I know you're implementing a lot of projects in the year 2020. Out of all those projects, name three projects you're executing in the year 2020, which will make you a leader in the year 2030. If the CEOs tell me you are working on total quality management, operational excellence, 
Six Sigma in the year 2020 so that I can become a leader in the year 2030. I typically tell them, welcome to 1970. There is nothing wrong with these ideas, but they are performance issues. They are box one, they are table stakes. Another word for performance management is best practices benchmarking. Best practices benchmarking is not strategy. Think about what happens in best practices benchmarking. Suppose you're doing scissors. What is best practices benchmarking? You look around your industry, look around others who are doing scissors, and then you ask yourself the question, is there someone who's doing scissors a little bit better, a little bit smarter? Then you measure the gap between yourself and the industry leader. Then you put in place programs to close that gap. Imagine what are you going to look like at the end of that process? How can you ask me for leadership? in the year 2030 by doing that. This is like saying, suppose you're in a locker room and you want to find out how bad your sock smells. Don't go benchmarking your socks against other people's socks in the locker room. They're all going to smell about the same. To me, strategy is about creating next practices. It's not about adopting to the best practices of industry leaders today. The $100 ECG machine is not best practices benchmark. Fosbury flop is not a linear improvement over system. It's a non-linear change. If you want to excel in three box solution, you must fundamentally change your strategy conversations inside your organization. Typically, when I go into a company, I typically ask them, show me your strategic plan. Let me see what you've written down as the strategy for your organization. What I typically get is a 25 inch thick binder. Well, you can't prepare a 25 inch thick binder for the future, it makes no sense. So much is unknown and unknowable about the future. You can't prepare a detailed plan for the future. In fact, I would say planning for the future is meaningless, but preparing for the future is terribly important. And the document that I like for preparation for the future is a document that I call strategy architecture. And this document has to be on a single sheet of paper. By the way, anytime you can reduce something to a single sheet of paper, you can get the whole organization aligned behind it. And on this single sheet of paper, you must have five bullets. Bullet number one is nonlinear shifts. Imagine the future of your industry in the next decade. And Tell me what the future looks like. By the way, I'm not asking you to predict the future of your industry by year 2030. You cannot even predict what is going to happen to your industry tomorrow, much less 10 years from today. This is not prediction exercise. But I am asking you to imagine the future of your industry. There is a fundamental difference between imagining the future and predicting the future. When I say imagine the future, I am asking you the art of the possible. I'm asking you, what is your point of view about year 2030? And that point of view is never formulated in a vacuum. It is always formulated based on what I call weak signals. In box one, you respond to clear signals. In box three, you respond to weak signals. The year 2030 is sending signals to you today. Because the signal is coming from the future, it is weak, it is feeble. Based on the weak signals that you see today, what are the disruptive technologies you're going to be dealing with in year 2030? Who will be your competitors in year 2030? Who will be your customers in 2030? By the way, the best way you can predict the future of your industry is to create it yourself. And if you want to create your future, first you have to imagine it. Bullet number two is strategic intent. Given these nonlinear shifts, what is your intent for year 2030? Even though the intent is expressed for year 2030, it should be visual. Everybody in your organization should be able to see the same future. I'm gonna say a few more words about strategic intent presently. Bullet number three is core competencies. What are you good at as an organization? For me, bullet number four is the most important. What I call annual priorities are nothing more then how are you going to allocate resources in the next 12 months? 
You cannot allocate 100% of the resources only in box one. Therefore, you must allocate resources across three horizons. How much resources are you allocating in horizon one? Horizon one is box one. My rule of thumb is anywhere from 50% up to 70% of the resources in the next 12 months should be invested in horizon one projects, which strengthen the core, process the performance gap. Horizon two and horizon three are examples of box three projects. And the difference between horizon two and horizon three is horizon three is more risky as compared to horizon two. In horizon two, what you're doing is these are box three ideas, but they are adjacent to the core. Because they are adjacent to the core, they are less risky. My rule of thumb is anywhere from 20% up to 30% of the resources in the next 12 months should be in Horizon 2 projects, which are adjacent to the core. How many projects are you funding in the next 12 months, which will be in Horizon 3? Horizon 3 projects are disruptive to the core. Any project which disrupts the core is more risky as compared to Horizon 2 projects which support the core. My rule of thumb is anywhere from 10% up to 20% of the resources in the next 12 months should be in Horizon 3 projects, which are disruptive to the core. And bullet number five is new core competencies. You cannot get to the future by only leveraging current capabilities. Part of competition for the future has to be about competence building agenda as well. By the way, if you can reduce these five bullets on a single sheet of paper, you can get the whole organization aligned behind it. A word about strategic intent. Perhaps the best way I can describe what a strategic intent is, is by describing what it is not. Strategic intent is not the motherhood and apple pie kind of mission statements. Once upon a time, my hobby used to be to collect the mission statements of Fortune 500 companies. And once I collected a few of them, I kind of quit doing it. Because once I collected a few of them, I felt pretty comfortable. I can paraphrase a typical mission statement. A typical mission statement would go something like this. We want to offer outstanding value to our customers. We want to treat our employees with respect and dignity. And we want to provide excellent returns to our shareholders, something along those lines. In fact, CEOs feel proud of, so proud of that imaginative statement. Typically, they kind of frame it and put it in the head office. Sometimes I'm kind of tempted to go in the middle of the night and kind of steal the mission statements of Fortune 500 companies and kind of mix them up and put it back. I have a feeling when employees come through the door next day, they're not going to say, wait a minute, that's not our mission statement. What happened to ours? Therein lies three differences between the motherhood and apple pie kind of mission statements and what I want to talk about as strategic intent. A strategic intent must meet three criteria. Criteria number one is direction. The reason why the motherhood and apple pie kind of mission statements fail this test of direction is if you strike out the name of one company, stick in another company's name, it's going to apply to a lot of companies in my industry. Then I say there is no point of view in this statement to galvanize your employees to create the future. What I mean by direction is, let's go north. That's direction. That tells me I don't want to go south. I don't want to go east. I want to go north. What I mean by direction is the big picture. Direction doesn't mean you know all the steps to get there. Direction is the end of the journey. At the beginning of every journey, the end should, should be in sight. Criteria number two is motivation, passion. Think about it this way. Suppose the CEO of Ford Motor Company stands up and says, our mission in life is to maximize shareholder wealth. Suppose you're an employee of Ford and you heard these words from the CEO. How much passion does it create? Are you telling yourself in the morning, my God, I can't wait to jump out of bed today and go to work so that I can add to the shareholders' pockets? Even if you own stock in Ford, probably that's not the reason why you wake up excited. We must create a compelling reason for each and every employee in our organization to wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I can't wait to get to work. 
because what I'm doing there is so meaningful to me. The third criteria is challenge. The whole idea behind strategic intent is to be bold, is to think big, define a sizable possibility gap. Direction, motivation, challenge. That's what you need in a strategic intent. If so, what is a good example of a strategic intent? Here is one. Tell me when John F. Kennedy stood up in the early 60s and said, we will put a man on the moon and bring him back before the end of this decade. Where do you think the country got so charged up? Certainly, when he said bring him back, that added to the excitement, I'm sure. Again, think about the three criteria, direction. Man on the moon is so directional because all of us see a moon every day. Somebody's going to go there and come back. I understand what you're talking about. Motivation, passion. This is about beating Soviet Union in the technology space, race. Not by doing best practices, benchmarking, but by doing something so incredible. Nobody is going to doubt who is number one in the world, US or USSR. That leads to the third criteria of challenge. This is a humongous challenge. Nobody has done this before. In fact, the scientific community put the probability we can do it at 20%. Optimistic probability, if I might add. There was a good 80% chance you cannot do it. Strategic intent is about thinking big. It's about dreaming big. It's about defining an unrealistic goal. Why do you need to define an unrealistic goal as a starting point for three-box solution? Common sense. Why? Because as human beings, our performance is a function of our expectations. This is what my grandfather was telling me. You got to think about the art of the possible, VG. You're too focused on performance gap. Your achievements are limited by your expectations. If your organizations have to be a leader in the year 2030, you must imagine that leadership first. If all that you can imagine is the province of Alberta to be a mediocre province by year 2030, that's about the best you will end up doing. One last thought as I begin to wrap up. My last thought is this. To me, the metaphor for competition for the future is a metaphor of a marathon race, as opposed to a sprint. You see, in a marathon race, you typically don't take a deep breath at the start of the race and cover 26 miles in one burst. That's what you do in a 100 meter dash. In a marathon race, at the start of the race, you have your ambition fixed for mile 26. But you never run this as a single race. At the start of the race, you just focus on the first 400 meters. Again, I want to reiterate, competition for the future is not about what you have to do in the year 2030. Competition for the future is all about how are you running the first 400 meters. The way you run the first 400 meters should be with a view to create the great company you want to create in mile 26. Strategy should always be about folding the future back. Unfortunately, in most organizations, strategy tends to be pushing the present forward. That is not strategy. In fact, recently I was with a company which told me they have a 20 year strategic plan. I was very impressed. I asked them, how did you prepare this 20 year plan? They told me they plan for next year. Then they added 1% to all the numbers. Well, that's not a 20 year plan, that's a budget. Strategy is what is your intent? What is your dream for mile 26 first? The dream cannot be in much detail. It is simply a vehicle to define direction, motivation and challenge. Then fold the dream back to the present. Think big, start small, scale up fast. Always focusing on one 400 meters at a time. Every 400 meters is an opportunity for you to test a hypothesis. Future is full of hypothesis. That's all it is because it's based on weak signals. So how do you create a future you cannot predict? The best way you can create a future you cannot predict is to proceed in 400 meter chunks. Every 400 meters is an opportunity for you to test the hypothesis. The hypothesis is not valid, you pivot. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. It's nice to talk about General Electric, nice to talk about 
high jump, next to talk about marathon race, next to talk about man on the moon. Let's talk about your organizations. Every one of the organizations listening in on the Zoom call, when you go back, I want you to collect your management team. Terry can make available the Zoom call recording. Let the team watch the recording and then answer two questions. Based on the weak signals that you see today, can you imagine the future of your industry in terms of disruptive technologies? New customers, new competitors, regulatory changes, etc. So can you prepare a list of hypotheses about the future based on weak signals? And the second assignment question is, given those weak signals, what is one box three idea? that your organization can launch. Again, please share these box three ideas with Terry. He's gonna collect them, put them in three groups, some connected with tourism, some connected with technology, some connected with energy, the three big stool, legs of the stool on which Alberta economy can be transformed. And then I'm gonna come back in early February and do a masterclass this masterclass is essentially answering your questions based on the three box solution that I have outlined and also take some of the ideas that you propose and then really begin to talk about are they really box three ideas, how you can refine it, how you can really drive change. This is not just a talk. I want to drive positive change inside your organizations. Let me just close with the following thought and then I'll turn it over to Anoop. Think about what organizations do when their business model begins to show signs of becoming obsolete. What do organizations do when their scissors runs out of steam? Top 11 things we can do with a dead horse. The question is, have you tried any of this inside your organizations? How about number 11? Have you tried that? How about number 10? How about number nine? How about number eight? How about seven? How about six? How about five? How about four? Three? How about two? That's good for consultants anyway. How about number one? Let me just share with you one thought and then I will turn it over to Anoop. I really urge you, this three box frame is a simple frame that you can use. When you get back, get a recording of this Zoom call. This is the three box solution book, which goes into greater depth on my framework and concepts. You should distribute this book to your entire team and have a book group meeting, really debate the future of your industry and box three idea that you can launch. I bet you this will take you a long way towards transforming your organization. Then share your box three idea with Terry and any questions that you have as you are applying the three box solution for your own organization. And then in the master class in early February, we are going to use your questions and it'll be essentially a Q and A with me where I can answer your questions, your issues, etc. One last thought, this three box solution is not just for your organizations. It's also something you can use to drive your own personal strategy. Everyone on the Zoom call, you must prepare a strategy architecture, not for your organization, but for yourself, for your own career. What is your personal mood statement? What are the competencies you're gonna build? What are the weak signals you're going to amplify? It's very important for everyone listening on the Zoom call, future is now. Future is not about what you have to do in the future. Therefore, you got to wake up every day and say, did I spend enough time in box one today? Did I spend enough time in box two today? Did I spend enough time in box three today? Very important. By the way, the reason why individuals do not invest in box three is if you don't invest in box three today, it does not hurt you today. It only hurts you in the future. That is why it is so easy to postpone such investments. Think about a box three investment for an individual, which would be doing exercise every day. 
If you did exercise every day, you are assured of future health. Why can't you practice the simple, commonsensical thing? Because today, November 17th, you may wake up and say, you know what? Today, I really don't have time to do exercise. I got to go listen to this VG. I haven't checked all my emails. I got a good excuse not to do exercise today. If you don't do exercise today, your health does not decay today. It decays in the year 2025. That's why you postpone. By the way, if you don't do exercise today, your health actually declines today. The decline is so small. The decline is so invisible, you don't notice. Part of what I'm saying is future comes in daily doses. Future never arrives all of a sudden in the future. You do not become old one day. You are becoming old every day. So let's accept that. Let's practice three box solution to drive our own personal career strategy for the better. By the way, this one hour, you put your box one on hold, isn't it? And you are listening to me and say, maybe let's some idea VG may give us. So you're invested in box three for one hour. Make that a habit. Perhaps the way I will end with this is the possibility gap that you face is much bigger than your performance gap. This is what my grandfather was telling me. VG, your possibility gap, the order of the possible is a lot bigger than your performance gap. If that is the case, what are you doing to close that possibility gap? Thank you very much. And I will turn it over to Anup. Thank you, VG. It was truly inspirational. I was I'm mesmerized. Uh, actually, when you were talking, uh, uh, our own Dean, Jim Dewald, uh, he has set a challenge for us. And uh, he says about our school, where big ideas come to life and bold leaders thrive. You actually provided some directions on how to achieve it. Uh, it was truly inspirational. And I'm sure all of us might come out with at least one or two or three things based on which we not only improve the efficiency of, of our ship, but probably think of uh, inventing a new aircraft. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, I'll hand over to Terry now. Thank you, Anoop. Um, I want to remind everybody in the audience that today's video will be made available for everybody to participate in. And I strongly encourage you to think about these adjacent possibilities that emerge in your organization and what they could actually mean to you as a person or for your organization, but also for the province of Alberta as a whole. And you will find out that in the follow-up emails, we'll give you more directions if you're interested in participating in the masterclass with VG in February. I think it's a tremendous opportunity. I warmly recommend that this is something that you should take advantage of. Examine those signals, come up with some box three ideas, and all the instructions on how to participate in that masterclass will be in the follow-up instructions, um, follow-up emails for this event. We also will have a survey uh, that will be shared with you. Please uh, give us some feedback on the event itself. And uh, I want to thank Anoop for your wonderful introduction. And thank you for, for VG. And VG, thank you so much. We learned so much today. Um, very inspirational. And, and, you know, I took so many things away. But some of the key things was that strategy is not really more than just realizing your own potential. And I really feel that we have unrealized potential in spades. And it just takes a shift in our attitude and our direction to start realizing that. And also to realizing that success in 2030 is seeded today, not in 2030. Those are some really powerful insights. And I want to thank you for that. I'd also like to thank you, our audience. You've chosen to spend time with us today. You could have been doing anything, but you're spending it here with us today. And we're very grateful for that. So thank you. I would also like to thank the team at Haskane for all the hard work that they've done putting this event together and supporting all of these things. Uh, it's been um, something that we could not have done without you. So thank you, staff, in Haskane. Uh, I'll remind you that our next session for Corporate Innovation Day will be at 1.30, and it will be Onboard, Launch, and Scale, an ecosystem building perspective on corporate innovation and transformation. Uh, I invite you all to participate in that. With that, I want to thank you all, and have a great day. Take care.